Hello everyone, my name is Josh, and this is Musical Mondays, and I'm going to be continuing my little review for Oliver for Musical Mondays. And where we left off, um, Oliver had just basic. well, we just basically got introduced to Bill Sykes, and um, Fagin is going through his little treasures, he gets them from a brick in the wall, and he's just going through his treasures, talking to his owl, waxing philosophically about his life and who will look after him at his old age. But um, because of the noise he's making with the treasures, Oliver wakes up and spies on Fagin, you know, looking through his treasures. And um, Fagin, when he notices him, gets worried and basically starts to, you know, interrogate him about what he saw and if he'll remember anything. And after that, he just basically shakes off and says, I didn't mean to frighten you, I'm sorry, and all these other things. And then he basically says, you know, these are my little treasures. They're all I've got to look. They've all I've got to look after me in my old age. And um, from there, we get two new songs. One of which is um, "I'll Do Anything," which is um, a great song. It's a song that I remember we sang. That was probably the first real group song that we sang at school, and it's a really good song. But um, this song does a very good job of setting up. Um, Nancy's introduction to Oliver and how she very quickly grows a fondness not just for um, the pickpockets but also for Oliver himself and her relationship with him and her need to you know make him live a better life than what she had is kind of very honestly and very lovely <laughs> very you know well set up here and um, there's a lot of great moments like um would you climb a hill, anything, wear a daffodil, anything, be me all your will, anything, even fight my bill, what, fisticuffs? <laughs> Great moments like that, and there's even a moment where um, Ron Moody as faking gets involved. But then after that wonderful sequence, we move on to the pickpocketing scene, where, as first of all, it starts off with a demonstration from Dodger, who t takes um, a, a wallet out of someone's pocket, Easy peasy, but then Oliver decides to do it, and another um, pickpocketer decides to get in before him. But when the person who's looking at the books at this bookstore, my kind of guy, a guy who likes books, um, when he starts to, you know, feel that something's going on in his pocket area, he turns round and all the other pickpocketers just leave, they flee, and he basically gets, mis he gets the assumption that, you know, Oliver was the one that took it. So a big chase ensues, and this leads to Oliver um, going uh, go, go through several you know obstacles, including you know having to hide in meat jackets at one point with the help of the pickpocketers, and um, there's even a moment where he gets up onto a train tracks above the city, and that kind of reminded me of all the public information films of the seventies, so it kind of gets you on edge a little bit, but it was actually really you know intense and wonderful, and this leads to a court case which gets debunked right off the bat with the shopkeeper coming in and saying, you know, this child had nothing to do with it, the two other boys stole his wallet. So the guy who um, had his wallet stolen um, decides to take Oliver home with him because he sees something in him that might not be yet explained. But then we have the wonderful um, sequence, Who Will Buy This Wonderful Morning, when Oliver wakes up in the morning in this grand estate and all these nice rich people are around and he hears a woman sing who will buy my sweet red roses two blooms for a penny and that's when they start to go into this song about you know who will buy this wonderful morning such a sky you ever did see he it's it's such a great you know moment and um i actually read it like it. it's um who will buy this wonderful morning such a sky you ever did see who will tie it up with a ribbon and put it in a box for me? It's so good. But um, moving on, it shows, this sequence basically shows Oliver at a transition stage where he's been through the workhouse, he's been a pickpocket on the streets of London and now he's officially in the, the high class. And it's a very good sequence overall, but then... Very quickly, Bill Sykes decides we need to get him back, nab him the first time he steps out of the door, but Nancy is heavily against it, and she basically says, you know, I'm not doing it, I'm not going, I think Oliver should stay where he is, where I have a chance of a decent life, 
Um, it eventually escalates to the point where there's raised voices, this big row going on, and this ends with Will slapping her in the face. And this moment is the moment where, when I was watching this at school as a kid, it was the moment where everyone in our class, there was a stunned silence, like... You could hear a pin drop. It was that shocking. And because this is the first time I had seen, you know, that kind of thing happen in a film before, because usually you don't you don't see that stuff or, or I didn't see that stuff on television. Unless of course there was EastEnders. But even then I didn't know the real context of what that was. It was just kind of like, oh, he's just a really horrible person. There's no one else quite like him like that, are there? Like But then I didn't really know that before, so it was really shocking to me. So this eventually leads into the song um, As Long As He Needs Me, which is a great song. Um, there's a line in the song where she goes, who else would love him still when they've been used so ill? And it goes to show that she literally is in an abusive relationship because most people with enough sense and enough strength would um, just leave him and bugger off to someone else. But she doesn't. She stays behind and she... Um, decides to decides to help get him back. When they do get him back, um, there's a big argument again. But this time, sorry, there was a fly on the table. There was a um, a fly on the table. So um, yeah, they get him back, and this gets into a song with Fagin, um, where he says, "I'm reviewing the situation," which is. We're at this moment where things are really quite intense. Oliver's back, but he's not really happy to be there. And things are really bad. I mean, Bill Sykes is literally a dynamite in regards to his temper and how he can go from 0 to 11 in a second, in, in a blink. And um, Fagan decides to up and leave. But it doesn't really go according to plan because he keeps on saying throughout the um, the song, it would always, every verse would end with the refrain of, I think I better think it out again, meaning that, you know, he he obviously is going back, he's refraining from that last point that he made. And the whole entire thing is basically build up, build up, build up, and then an anticlimax. Kind of like the way the uh, poem The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot is written, where it starts off, you know, with with, with three lines, which are, which is building up or, or stirring to a crescendo or to a high point, but then there's an anticlimax that undercuts it. And um, that's just the way this song was written. So it's a really good song. It's really you know, enjoyable and entertaining. Um, it's really funny, but it also really kind of has a layer of tragedy to it because you can tell that this is Fagan. He's a guy in twilight years of his life and he really just feels like he's on edge. And it's really not great. So Oliver is chosen to go out on a job with Bill and Bill decides to let him go into the house, rob some stuff, open the door. But things don't go according to plan when Oliver ends up making a lot of noise and the resident of the house ends up waking up and, you know, attacking them, essentially, getting the guard dogs on him. And there's a scene where um, the owner pulls out a pistol and goes as if to shoot someone. And you're kind of thinking deliberately that either Bill's been shot, Oliver's been shot, or um, Bullseye and Bill Sykes' dog has been shot. But when they get back to the tavern, when they get back to the place where they will go to have a drink, um, no one seems to be injured or limping or doing any real indication that they're injured. They just both look really tired out or traumatised. Whereas in the book, um, Oliver Twist is shot... And he's fatally wounded and he ends up having to stay in bed. He's bedridden for several days afterwards in the book, whereas in this case he isn't. And then we jump into the final song of the film, which is Um Papa. And that song simply goes, um, Um Papa, Um Papa, that's how it goes. Um Papa, Um Papa, everyone knows. They all suppose what they want to suppose when they hear um papa. Yeah, that that that's a good song. There's a little ditty they're singing in the city, especially when they've been on the gin or the beer. There is Mr. Fog Glass, he'd rather have the odd glass, but never when he thought anybody could see. <laughs> it's it's such a good song, I love it. 
But the whole entire point of this song being made is so that, you know, like with It's a Fine Life, um, Nancy can stir up a crowd and she can really, you know, get everyone to sing and dance to the point where she's created quite the spectacle. And that's the thing that I love about this, this film is how the spectacles are established because in both Consider Yourself and Who Will Buy This Wonderful Morning and um, and um, On Papa, you really do get a sense of these characters are actually really good at establishing this great spectacle of a piece. And in this case, it actually is plot related. With Nancy, she's a character who, when she sings, she can very easily get this... Um, this reaction out of a crowd and it really kind of gives you that sense of oh she really can do that and she can you know just really get everyone to sing just but but by sheer presence and by she you know happiness and joy at doing this job that she does she can just do that and it's the same with this but except in this case the first song it's a fine life does a good job of resetting up her character and how infectiously um, joyful she is and how she can create good you know jolly good time with a lot of characters even in the I do I do anything sequence all the pickpockets just really love Nancy as a mother figure and you, it kind of rubs off on Oliver as well all, all these characters love Nancy and it just it just, it just really kind of shows what kind of a, a good person she is and how lively and you know optimistic and happy she is but in this moment she's actually really afraid she's uncertain what to do she, so she decides to do what she does best which is to stir up a good crowd and sing a song and it's while this is happening while the crowds are all dancing in this tavern or this bar that um nancy decides to um take oliver and go off with him and it's very suspenseful because when nancy and oliver are just about to, to run in the clearing for freedom Bill is just a few steps behind, or a few paces behind. It's really intense. It really kind of builds up to the point where um, he ends up catching up with them just as he's about to go and go back with his grandfather. And in the book, it's um, revealed quite openly that he's his grandfather, whereas in the in this version, you have to kind of jump, few, <laughs> jump through a few visual loops in order to run, come to that conclusion. Excuse me. Mm, excuse me. You have to jump through a few um, logic loops to come to that conclusion. But it's, it's still well established. But I feel like the um, David Lean and the original, the David Lean version and the original novel really did a good job of really kind of making that clear to the audience. But some because that's just them spelling it out for you. But I actually really do like the fact that they rely more visually on it. Like, oh, you just have to look at the picture that's on the wall in the house to kind of see that, oh, it looks, he looks. The woman in the picture looks a little bit like Oliver or has some of his facial features like like his eyes or <clears throat> something. But yes, this sequence ends very brutally with Nancy being beaten to death, essentially. <clears throat> and um, it's really horrible, really horrific. Even watching it as a doll, it still kind of gives you that sense that, oh, this is really brutal. Even though you don't see anything, it still gives, that, it gives you that sense of you can just use your imagination and the way the actress who plays Nancy sells it in this very horrific way, it really kind of, <clears throat> really kind of puts the, the the shivers up here and really kind of adds this level of suspense to everything and this level of terror that Bill Sykes has gone off the deep end and he's not going to come back. And <clears throat> it ends with... Um, Bill coming back and Fagan notices that there's blood on his coat and Nancy isn't there. And it's when that moment happens and you see the the boys' pickpocketers' reactions, it's horrible. It really is the worst thing that you could possibly see. And it's one of those moments, again, where you could hear a pin drop in the classroom when I watched this for the first time as a child because you it, it was one of those moments where it was really quite brutal. It really was to us as a as children so it really could have had that degree of it really did sell that moment quite beautifully and it really could have showed that this is a guy who's way off the deep end and he's not coming back and not only that but the person that they really all care about they really could have you know felt such a lovely warm person is no longer there because she's been horrifically murdered and um the police are all in hot pursuit of him everybody is in pursuit of bill sykes and um 
it's like cops the Dickensian edition. <laughs> like, um, yeah, it, it really could have that feel to it. And Bullseye manages to be a good guy for once. He manages to lead the charge. And um, there's this really great sequence where um, uh, Bill is trying to get um, over, over a moat that's slowly sinking the woodworks. And it's gotten quite infectious. But he ends up, you know, getting shot down and... Um, and he dies. But the way he dies, he gets shot and then, of course, he just drops. And the rope is around his waist and he's just basically swinging back and forth, back and forth. And you just hear the, the, the creaking of the rope as it swings back and forth, back and forth. And it's really kind of eerie and it really adds a certain level of atmosphere. And again, stunned silence. There's no musical score. There's no drum. There's kind of no morbid drum beats it's all just, you know, silence and atmosphere. And then the Artful Dodger picks a pocket, and in the following scene, when Fagan is just contemplating his his uncertain future, having lost his treasures in the moat that's sinking, he meets Dodger, and he gives him a wallet with some money, and he says, oh, we can form a partnership. And then they do a revised version or a repo or a... Um, reprised version of um, reviewing the situation, which kind of goes, we can all think it out again, which is a, a great way of tying it all together. And then Oliver gets to return home to his grandfather, and they all live happily ever after. This musical is bloody brilliant. I think it's one of the best musical adaptations of a Dickensian novel that I've ever seen. It's really fantastically done. The choreography is fantastic. The performances, the dramatic performances, when it gets really dramatic they really do a good job of really kind of selling the more intense moments and every song has some level of characterization to it whether it's to really kind of set up who these characters are or what their general motivations are supposed to be or even if it gives you an insight into just their daily routines or whatever or how they how other people are reacting to them through the songs it really does add a level level of personality and a level of character and a level of style to everything that really kind of just is unrivaled in any other musical. And I think that's the key to a good musical is when you really do feel like it can really use... It's a great shorthand in a, in a very bizarre way. Like, if you're adapting a novel like Oliver Twist, you, you really do get a sense of what's a shorthand way in which we can tell... We can tell a person who a character is just by a few short things. Well, that's just make a song about them that's why disney films are mostly musicals because they can just use the the musical number as a way of establishing who that character is let's say for example the genie's song friend like me really gives you an insight into how powerful the genie is and how you can use all these different things and the style of the song really helps as well Oh, and of course the song um the reprise of prince ali is a great example of showing how Aladdin's a fraud and Jafar is now the king of the, the Sultan of Agrabah and he's going to control the world and <laughs> consume in all this darkness. But um, yeah, whatever it is, it serves a purpose. And Oliver Twist does that exceptionally well. And with the last film I did for Musical Mondays, Grease, it also does this. So I'm going to give this a five out of five stars. It's a fantastic, um, it's a fantastic story. It's well written. It's well acted. It's a great, it's a well-directed story. Great performances from Oliver Reed and um, Ron Moody. And um, the actors who play the, the pickpockets, the kids, and, of course, the actor who plays Oliver, Mark Lawrence, I think. Mark Lawson, I think his name is. And I've forgotten who the actor is who plays the Artful Dodger in this. But he was good. The actress who played Nancy was fantastic, especially during the scenes. The scene where she got slapped really kind of sold the horror of that situation. And it was just a fantastic film overall. So I'm giving this five out of five stars. And this has been Joshua with Musical Mondays. I hope you've had a very good day and look forward to more very soon. Take care. Bye-bye for now.